Okay, folks, that's time. So the question is, analyze the domestic and foreign policies that sought to prevent the spread of communism during the Truman administration. Now again, uh, we haven't learned about domestic policy yet, which we'll cover a little bit today and more on Monday. What we want to focus on today is foreign policy. So uh, let's go with uh, Jacqueline. What are some of the things that we did to try to prevent the spread of communism? Yeah, what do you have so far? So the two key ones you got, you got Greece and, uh, you got Truman that gave money to Greece and Turkey, 400 million, and you also had the Marshall Plan that gave 12.5 billion to the European economies to recover. So good, good so far. Uh, what are the other things that we did to uh, try to prevent the spread of communism here? So let's go with uh, Jonathan, what else did we do? Besides Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan, what are the other things that we did? What are the other things that we did to try to prevent the spread of communism besides Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan? I'll come a whole bunch of other ones. So Jasmine, what else did we do? So the Organization of American States, and what did that try to do? Yeah, communism where? It tried to prevent the spread of communism where? Robert? Which states? And? Germany? Nope. Where did it try to prevent the spread of communism, guys? The Organization of American States. Kathy? Latin America. So it tried to prevent the spread of communism in Latin America. Jasmine, where did it try to prevent the spread of communism? Latin America. Jonathan, what organization was created to try to prevent the spread of communism in Latin America? Organization of American States. Let's keep going here. Uh, what else is this another organization, Victoria? The Molotov Plan? The Molotov Plan is not actually an American plan. That was actually intended to spread communism. So that's the opposite of the Marshall Plan. So it actually has the opposite effect. So it's not the Molotov Plan. That actually has the opposite effect. Robert? Yeah, the IMF. The IMF also was designed to try to prevent the spread of communism. What else tried to prevent the spread of communism? Jasmine. Berlin uh, the Berlin Airlift. Yeah, definitely. The Berlin Airlift also tried to prevent the spread of communism. Anything else that we did to try to prevent the spread of communism besides these things? The World Bank tried to prevent the spread of communism. Radio Free America tried to prevent the spread of communism. Voice of America tried to prevent the spread of communism. So again, are there a lot of things that tried to prevent the spread of communism at this time? Yeah. Yeah. And as so far as we know, have they been successful thus far? Yeah, so as far as we know so far, they've been pretty successful. So make sure you guys can cite different things that tried to prevent the spread of communism. Okay, so here we go today. Oops. Talked about the Berlin Airlift already. Today, let's talk about all the other things that we did to try to prevent the spread of communism. We'll start off with NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO was created in response to the Berlin Crisis, or the Berlin Blockade. What was the Soviet Union trying to do during the Berlin Blockade? Trying to block Berlin. They're trying to block Berlin and take it over, right? They're trying to take it over. And so in response to this threat from the Soviet Union, we created NATO. It was in response to the Berlin crisis or the Berlin blockade. And what it did was it created a military alliance between the US and Western Europe. It created a military alliance between the United States and Western Europe. This will also include Canada, Greenland, whatever else. But the basic idea is it created a military alliance between America and Western Europe. Okay, that's NATO. Now, this military alliance between the U.S. and its uh, European allies was supposed to promote, and here they are actually, all these blue countries, those are all NATO countries. The basic idea was they were supposed to promote collective 
security. It was supposed to promote collective security against who? Yeah, communist aggression. It was supposed to prevent, it was supposed to create collective security against communist or Soviet aggression. It was collective security against communist or Soviet aggression. And what it did was the basic idea, an attack on one is an attack on all. So if you attack one NATO country like West Germany, you attack all NATO countries. Now, in particular, who is the most powerful NATO member? US. United States. So when the United States created this organization, what it did was that it included Western Europe or protected the U.S. protected its allies with what we like to call a nuclear umbrella. It protected its allies with a nuclear umbrella. The basic idea is, if you attack one of our allies, what are we protecting them with? A nuclear, a nuclear weapon. So we protected our allies with a nuclear umbrella. The term is that our nuclear policy doesn't encompass all of our allies. So it's not just an attack on us that results in nuclear war. If you attack West Germany, what else will that result in? Nuclear, nuclear war. war. So they are all included in the nuclear umbrella. Again, the basic idea is to withstand Soviet or communist aggression. And this also proves pretty successful. It does prevent the spread of communism because will the Soviets second guess invading West Germany, for example? Sure, because an invasion of West Germany means what? A nuclear war. So the Soviets might second guess further expansion, further invasions, further aggression, because it means nuclear attack. So again, here's your basic to Russia with love. We'll send you a nuclear bomb if you attack us. The Soviets responded to NATO with the Warsaw Pact. The Soviets responded to NATO with the Warsaw Pact. So the Soviets responded to NATO with the Warsaw Pact. And pretty much the Warsaw Pact was a military alliance between who? Well, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. China, not yet, not really. China won't join this. This is really for Eastern Europe. But this is a military alliance between the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. An attack on Poland is an attack on Russia is the basic idea. Okay, so this was all fine and dandy, and it was okay for us to say, sure, we will protect you with our nuclear umbrella until 1949 when the Cold War really begins. And the reason why the Cold War begins in September 1949 is because this is when the Soviets explode their first atomic bomb, which means now, what do the Soviets have? nuclear weapons and this is a serious problem if the Soviets have nuclear weapons might they be able to use it on us now sure and so the whole idea of a nuclear umbrella becomes less popular an attack on West Germany results in a nuclear attack on Russia maybe but why might we be hesitant about that now because they might use nuclear weapons against us and so now this is when the Cold War begins before in September 1949, was America willing to go to war with Russia? Sure, we had nuclear weapons. We could blow them out of the water. But now that they have nuclear weapons, this does not become a very good policy. So we start becoming a little bit hesitant about nuclear war now that the Russians have access to nuclear weapons. Uh, and they actually built it three years earlier than we expected. And how was it they were able to build them so quickly? Spies. They stole Soviet or American plans and sold them to the Soviets. So spies allowed them to build nuclear weapons a lot faster. Anyway, one of the major failures of the Truman Doctrine is when China becomes communist also in 1949. This is not a good year for us. In 1949, China becomes a communist country. Despite American efforts to fight communism, in China. We did fight in the Chinese Civil War. We did send soldiers just a little bit, 
But in 1949, China becomes communist despite American efforts. We tried to fight this and we still lost. And so this, folks, shows a failure of what? It's a failure of the Truman Doctrine. It's a failure of containment. And this is a major failure for America because overnight, 25% of the entire world's population becomes communist. <laughs> That's a problem. So this is a failure of the Monroe Doctrine. I'm sorry, Truman Doctrine. This is a failure of containment because, again, overnight, 25% of the world's population becomes communist. And that is a problem for us. Many people criticized Truman saying, how could you let this country fall to communism? And he said, look, it wasn't my war to lose. The Chinese people lost that war. I tried to help, but ultimately they chose communism and there was nothing I can do. So it wasn't my loss. It was their war to lose. Okay? So there's that going on. And so... Uh, China becomes communist, and you have the emergence of two Chinas. Two Chinas emerge. The China that won stayed in mainland China, and they came to be ruled by Mao Zedong. And Mao Zedong was the communist ruler who ends up ruling mainland China, which becomes known as the People's Republic of China, or the PRC, supported by the Soviets. The Chinese, supported by the Americans that lost, fled China and they moved to Taiwan. And they became the exiled Chinese government that believed themselves to be the true China, and they called themselves China. In this case, the Republic of China. So you have the PRC and the ROC both view themselves to be China, and for a good 40 years, we have two Chinas. Actually, today, we still have two Chinas. We technically have two Chinas. Taiwan says it's China. China says it's China. They both technically have rights or claims to the government. They both want to be independent. China says, no, Taiwan is part of China. It's a complicated matter. In any case, we have two Chinas, ROC and the PRC. People from, yeah, Republic of China and then the People's Republic of China. They're two different Chinas. They're represented differently uh, in the Olympics. What? Everyone's allowed to participate. Yeah. How come there's like people are country and they Maybe because they're a nation and not a country. Like the Palestinian nation, they have no country. They're a group of people that want to have a country, but they don't have one. Then in 1952, something incredible in science happens. In 1952, the Americans successfully detonate the hydrogen bomb. And the hydrogen bomb is 750 times more powerful than the bombing of Nagasaki. It's 750 times more powerful. Now, in 1953, the Soviets detonate a hydrogen bomb. And so, 1952, the Americans detonate the first hydrogen bomb, which is 750 times more powerful than an atomic bomb. In 1953, again with stolen secrets, the Soviets detonate their own hydrogen bomb. And now, we have a world in which we literally can destroy all of civilization because these bombs are that powerful. And so to give you guys a quick clip of what this looks like, though it's been my understanding that some of you have already seen this before, which is fine by me. Here. You have a grandstand seat here to one of the most momentous events in the history of science. In less than a minute, you will see the most powerful explosion ever witnessed by human eyes. The blast will come out of the horizon just about there. And this is the significance of the moment. 
This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. For the sake of all of us, and for the sake of our country, I know that you join me in wishing this expedition well. It is now 30 seconds to zero time. All goggles are turned away. Do not remove goggles or face first until 10 seconds after the first light. Mike was a nickname for this bomb. 9,000 degrees instantly. That weird shape that you see is all the heat and all the pressure and pretty much what it does it turns all the atoms around you and all the oxygen into plasma. It just fries everything and it breaks everything down to the atomic level and just turns everything into plasma. It's a... Uh, and again, that's a 10 megaton bomb. The one at Hiroshima was a 20 kiloton. So just so you guys know a megaton is uh, a thousand more than a kiloton. <laughs> so if there is a megaton, let's see, there was 10 kilotons, and this is, sorry, 20 kilotons, this is 10 megatons, this is what, like 5,000 times or something like that, a crazy amount. And by the way, the biggest bomb ever tested, 100 megatons. So imagine this 10 times more powerful. <laughs> Uh, well, we likely have one also, but the last recorded nuclear test of a 10 megaton nuclear weapon was the Tsar bomb uh, that was detonated by the Soviet Union. We pretty much know that our bombs will work and we can make a 10 megaton uh, yield weapon, but the Soviets tested the Tsar bomb, which was a 100 megaton, and they tested it at 100 megatons. Um, yeah, oh yeah, radiation, all that stuff. But again, folks, this is the world that we live in now. And just to uh, let you guys know, there are currently, I think, 19,000 of these still around in the world. It's a problem. So the hydrogen bomb is now created, and now we have to deal with the Korean War. Now, obviously, nuclear weapons and the hydrogen bomb are not synonymous. They're not the same thing. But... The fact that the Soviets have nuclear weapons, does that make it harder for us to prevent the spread of communism? Yeah, yeah. It does help make it a little bit more difficult to prevent the spread of communism. Which brings us to the Korean War. The Korean War was fought between 1950 and 1953. It's a war that most people forget ever happened. Most, this is also known as the Forgotten War. Because most people do forget that we ever fought the Korean War. Because they, it gets... Uh, hidden in the shroud of Vietnam. So people forgot that there was a Korean War from 1950 to 1953. In this war, here's the background. After World War II, the Soviet Union controlled North Korea because they liberated the Japanese out of North Korea after World War II. The Americans controlled South Korea because they liberated South Korea from the Japanese during World War II. Does that make sense so far? So the Americans and the Soviets drove the Japanese out of North Korea and South Korea respectively. So the Soviets drove the Japanese out of North Korea, the Americans drove the Japanese out of South Korea. That's what happened during World War II. Everyone good so far? Yes.
uh, that would be the Korean War. That would be the Korean War. And so what ends up happening is that because the Soviets are in North Korea, naturally North Korea will have what kind of government? Communist. Communist. And because America is in South Korea, naturally South Korea will have what kind of government? Capitalist. A capitalist or democratic government. So here's the issue. Despite the fact that you have now two Koreas, both Koreas want to be united. South Korea wants to unite under a democratic government. North Korea wants to be united under a communist government. And you see where the problem lies here. They want to be united, but there's two different types of governments. Well, in 1950, the North Koreans launched a surprise invasion of South Korea. It's quick, it's a surprise, and it takes everyone by surprise, but as a North Korean invasion of South Korea begins in 1950, and they are supported by Russia. This is a Russian-supported invasion of South Korea. And a lot of people question, you know, how do they support them? Well, they supported them with Russian tanks, Russian planes. I mean, they provided them the artillery and weapons necessary to invade. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you don't have Russian soldiers on the ground. You have Russia giving weapons to North Korea and saying, go fight. And if you win, I win. Now, is America going to let South Korea fall to communism? No, we're not. So what happens is that North Korea does overrun the Seoul, uh, overrun Seoul, which is the South Korean capital, and they seek to drive them out of the peninsula. So North Korea drives them all the way to the area of Pusan. And by the way, they also drive out UN peacekeeping forces. So the North Koreans are able to drive the South Korean army and the UN peacekeeping forces all the way down into Pusan, which means have they almost driven them completely out of South Korea already? Yeah. Yes. So this is a pretty good invasion for North Korea because it was a complete surprise. And even with the United Nations trying to help drive the North Koreans out, they're not doing a very good job. Everyone good so far. So they're able to drive them out. So what happens is America wants to get more involved in this war. They want to make sure we do fight. So America sends General, General MacArthur and American troops to begin what is known as the Incheon Landing. So General, General MacArthur is sent by Truman to assist the South Koreans, and they do so with the Incheon Landing. And here's why the Incheon Landing is so significant. North Korea at this time is focused on wiping the UN and South Korean forces out of Pusan. So they're all facing Pusan. So why is the Incheon landing such a great idea? It's going to attack them from behind. And in military speak, this is known as a pincer attack, where you attack from both sides. And so in any case, the Americans launch a pincer attack, you don't have to know that part, but they land in Incheon, and what they do is they drive the North Koreans back to North Korea. So is that a success for us? Yes. The success of the Incheon landing drives the North Koreans back into North Korea. But we don't stop there. We figure, hey, now that we got them on the run, what should we do? Yeah, go into North Korea and get rid of them completely. And so we do. Combine U.S. and U.N. forces recapture Seoul, the capital of South Korea, and we drive the military North Korean army into China. We drive them out of North Korea, and now they're in China. So the U.N. and U.S. forces drive the North Korean army out of North Korea, and they retreat to where? China. Now they're hiding behind the border in China. And America says, let's go after them. Let's end this now. Let's get rid of the communist North Koreans right now. Let's end it. And hell, we might as well invade China too. Uh, maybe not China. Just the North Koreans though. Now, China warns them. America, UN, whomever's down there. Do not cross the Yalu River. 
if you cross the Yalu River, China will see that as an act of war. But MacArthur's like, ah, China, what are you going to do about it? And so the American and UN forces cross the Yalu River and proceed to hunt down the rest of the North Koreans in China. By doing so, they awaken the sleeping dragon. <laughs> By violating China's territorial integrity, 300,000 Chinese soldiers pour over the Yalu River border and drive the Americans all the way back into South Korea. All the gains that we made were lost within a week because 300,000 soldiers pour over that border and surprise us. So we probably should not have invaded China. Yes, we could have taken all of Korea, but because we got greedy, Truman, or rather the Chinese, drive us all the way back down to South Korea. By the way, they almost take South Korea again. But luckily, the American forces push back to the original border. <laughs> so all of that happened. And now we're back to the original border again. Now, MacArthur is going to get fired. But not for the reason that you think. No. MacArthur is not going to get fired because he failed the invasion of North Korea. He successfully defended South Korea. But the reason why he's going to get fired is because of this. MacArthur said, I can't believe we were driven out. MacArthur demands that we use the H-bomb on China. He says, we should kill them now. We should get rid of them and blow them off the face of the earth. Look what they've done. They're too powerful. We must use nuclear weapons against China. So MacArthur threatens the H-bomb, or demands the H-bomb against China. He says, there is no substitute for victory. You know, just having South Korea is not good enough. We have to have North Korea and eliminate communism in China. So he wants to use nuclear weapons. We have them, why not use them? Truman says, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. Truman wanted a limited war. He did not want a world war. So he said, this is a war in Korea. We didn't make it, that's it. We are not going to use nuclear weapons. Does that make sense so far? He told MacArthur that. MacArthur, this is a limited war. No nuclear weapons. MacArthur disagreed. So you're weak, Truman. You don't know what's at stake. You're not taking this war seriously. And so what MacArthur does is he threatens North Korea and he says, surrender or we will use nuclear weapons. Is this against the advice or the order of President Truman? Yes, it is. It is an open defiance of Truman. And so Truman says, fine, MacArthur, that is the complete opposite of what I told you. You're fired. So Truman fires MacArthur for disobeying his orders. The reason why the firing of MacArthur is so significant is that it shows that who is in charge of the military? Truman, Truman the president, and not who? generals. It's not the military in charge of the military. It's the civilians. What this shows us is that civilians are in charge of the military. That's why the firing of Tru uh, MacArthur is important. It shows that civilians are in charge of the military. Because if the military was in charge, what would they do? About everything. everything. Always go to war. Attack everyone. Because that's what they do. That's what they're bred for. But do the American people want that? No. And so this is good that, again, the military is controlled by the civilian government. In any case, we fire MacArthur, and eventually we sign a Korean armistice in 1953. An armistice is what? A ceasefire. A ceasefire. Yes. We signed a ceasefire in 1953, a Korean armistice. What this armistice agrees to 
is restoring the borders to the 38th parallel. The, we restore the original borders at the 38th parallel. You guys know what a parallel is? It's the lines across the world. So they restore the border at the 38th parallel and they create what becomes known as the demilitarized zone or the DMZ. They create what becomes known as the demilitarized zone or the DMZ. And on the DMZ, what are you not allowed to have? Tanks, guns, weapons. You're not allowed to have anything there. It's supposed to be like this peace border. It stretches for like 50 miles on both sides. But what we do have on the DMZ are landmines all over the place <coughs> to prevent another invasion. Yes. You have landmines and guards protecting that border, right? Yes. So on the DMZ, you can't have anything except landmines. But right outside the DMZ, you have soldiers, tanks, planes, always on patrol. In the event that North Korea ever decides to try to invade again. In fact, we found one, two, three, four tunnels that the Koreans were trying to dig underneath the DMZ so that they could invade in the future. So we, in recent years, we found underground tunnels uh, that the North Koreans were building in an attempt to try to invade in the future. Uh, they were buried. They were, uh, they're, yeah, today still exists. Because, folks, if you notice, we signed a ceasefire. We never signed a peace treaty, which means to this day, technically, we are still at war with Korea. We never signed a treaty. Huh? No, Vietnam, we did, end a we did sign a treaty to end that war. But we never signed a peace treaty with Korea. North Korea is always threatening America. Yeah, I mean, they developed a nuclear weapon, and they threatened us with it. That's all the time. Folks, results of the Korean War. Quiet down, folks. Number one. You had 54,000 Americans killed. So a lot of American casualties for three years. It's quite a bit. 54,000 killed. That's a lot for a three-year war, guys. 54,000 Americans killed in a three-year war. But why is this a success? Well, yes, but what does it show? Give me historical context. What did this prove work? It showed that the Truman Doctrine and containment worked. Did the Soviets try to spread communism into South Korea? And were they successful for like a year? Did we drive them out? Yes. This is why it was successful. They tried, we responded, we defended. The Truman Doctrine worked. Questions there? What's all that? Bullets. Bullets. So, Korean War, it shows that containment worked. So again, if you had to do an assessment about Truman's foreign policy and containment, were there many successes? What was the one major failure? China. China is the major failure. So all of all the successes, Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, Voice of America, uh, Organization of American States, World Bank, IMF, United Nations, Korean War, Berlin Airlift, the one big failure, despite all of that, is that the most populous country in the world falls to communism. Talk about domestic policy then. What's happening here at home? Well, back at home, folks, a lot of things we're going to deal with. Some of the issues that Truman has to deal with are first, well, in his first term, he's going to deal with post war anxieties. What are people afraid of? Not another war, another Great Depression. Because are we still producing as much weapons as we were during World War II? No. no. And so that means, are those jobs going to be lost again? I mean, is GNP going to fall? And so there was a fear that we might enter another depression after the war. There was a serious fear. Because people believed that the only thing that saved us was the war. And now that the war is over, uh, are we going to go back to depression? That was a fear. And he has to fix those fears. The other thing he has to deal with that he tries, he tries to fix but fails, is the Taft-Hartley Act. 
The Taft-Hartley Act was passed over Truman's veto, which means Congress passed it, Truman vetoed the bill, and then what happened? What do you call it? What's it called? Override. Override. Very good. We overrode the veto, or Congress overrode his veto. So he tried to pass it, or he tried to kill it. It was overridden, therefore it became law. And let me explain why this law was so hated. The purpose of this law was to weaken labor unions. The purpose of the Taft-Hartley Act was to weaken labor unions. That was the purpose. Let me explain the four parts of it. But the purpose of the Taft-Hartley Act was to weaken labor unions. And here's what it did. Number one, it required unions to take non-communist oaths. It required unions to take non-communist oaths. And a lot of unions didn't like that because is it against the law to be communist in America? No, it's not against the law to be a communist. You can be a communist, you're just not a good person to most people. But it's not against the law. But they said in order to join a union, you have to take a non-communist oath. That's the first thing. So a lot of people didn't like that. Second thing that it did that people didn't like, it banned strikes that endangered the public safety. It banned strikes that endangered the public safety. Who was the first president to say that? Uh, uh, Coolidge. Coolidge. Remember the Boston police strike? Yeah. So again, who is not allowed to strike now? Police, police, doctors, nurses, firefighters, air traffic controllers, that kind of thing. So did unions like that? No, that hurts unions. The third thing that was included, they banned closed shops. Let me explain what that means. We did talk about this previously, but they banned closed shops. A closed shop, guys, is an industry or a business that requires union membership. They banned closed shops, and a closed shop is a business or industry that requires union membership for employment. So for example, Hacienda La Puente School District, is it an open shop or a closed shop? Closed. closed. You have to join the teachers union if you want to work here. Uh, it's not a choice. I have to join the union. What about uh, Best Buy? Open shop or closed shop? Open. open shop. You can choose to join the union if you want, but you don't have to. Does that make sense to everyone? It's a closed shop versus an open shop. They banned closed shops, saying you can't force people to join unions. Lastly, they required or mandated a 60-day cooling off periods before strikes. They mandated or required a 60-day cooling off period before strikes. So they mandated or required a 60-day cooling off period before strikes. So here's why this is a problem for labor. If you say, all right, guys, we're going on strike. Are you allowed to go on strike that day? No. You have to wait 60 days to think about it if you really want to go on strike. And then after 60 days, then you can go on strike. Why is this bad for labor? What can happen in those 60 days? You can hire replacement workers. So this becomes a problem for labor unions because now they're easily replaced. Well, I get two months to replace you? Great, thanks for letting me know that you're gonna go on strike. This is a problem for labor unions. And so again, folks, despite our effort to uh, get rid of this, uh, Truman's veto is overridden. So here they feel like people are getting chained up. They even asked Truman to veto the bill, which he does veto, but again, it's overridden. Here's laborers wanting him to veto it. And again, sign here, not us, says Mine Mills. I'm not gonna sign there, it's a bear trap. In any case. So how do we prevent the economic downturn then? So again, the economy looks like it might get bad. It looks like uh, maybe the American people want to, um, I don't know, worsen the power of labor unions or weaken the power of labor unions. So how are we gonna make the economy stronger? Yes. Yeah. So, preventing the economic downturn. So the first thing that Truman does to make sure that the economy is restored 
is he passes the Employment Act of 1946. The Employment Act of 1946. And what the Employment Act of 1946 does is that it creates government policies it creates government policies to promote maximum employment, production, and purchasing power. So it creates government policies to promote maximum employment, production, and purchasing power. Maximum employment, production, and purchasing power. So what I mean by that is that if you hire 10 people this year, but you can hire five more, I will give you a $10,000 credit if you hire those extra five people. So again, maximum employment, production, and purchasing power. So I will give you tax benefits if you hire more workers. I will give you tax benefits if you produce more efficiently. I will give you tax benefits if you increase people's wages, thus giving them more purchasing power. Does that make sense to everyone? So he's trying to create government policies to improve the economy. Also, with the Employment Act, he sells government factories that we use during what? World War II. He sells government factories to businesses for low prices. Government factories to businesses for low prices. Because is the government in the business of producing stuff anymore? No. So we're going to sell them really cheap to businesses for low prices. We're going to sell them to businesses for really low prices. And how is that going to help the U.S. economy? It's going to create jobs. Instead of spending, let's say, $30,000 on a factory, I could spend $10,000 on a factory, and the rest of the money can be used to what? Hire workers, hire people. So that's the basic idea. He wants to increase employment in America. Good so far? Again, we're trying to prevent another depression. We're trying to recover the U.S. economy after the war. The next major problem is all those soldiers. We had 16 million people go fight, right? Well, what's going to happen when they come home? Well, that's a question. And so uh, FDR passed a bill called the Servicemen Readjustment Act of 1944, and Truman just continues the bill. But the GI Bill is passed in 1944, also known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. And this was in response to the fears of unemployment for 16 million Americans that are coming back after the war, which is a pretty decent fear. 16 million people are coming back, and we don't know if we have jobs for them. And so we passed the Servicemen Readjustments Act, or the GI Bill of Rights, in response to fears of unemployment for the 16 million veterans. And so how are we going to get these people to make sure they're not unemployed? What can we do with them to make sure they're unemployed? We can, we can get them to the college free or like Yep. So one of the things that the GI Bill did was it sent 8 million veterans to college. Is that going to help? Yeah. That's 8 million people no longer having to look for jobs for at least four years. That's pretty good. That gives us time, right? And in that time, those 8 million people that we pay to go to college, can we train them in high-tech industries? Yeah. Can we train them to be engineers and electricians and whatever else? So is that going to benefit the U.S. economy? Sure, we're going to make them experts. So guys, the 1950s end up having very intelligent population of people because we we're sending so many to go to college on the government dime. So that does improve the U.S. economy as well. So 8 million go to college, it cost us over $14.5 billion to send them to college, but hey, was it worth it? Yeah, yeah because the economy is going to increase so much more than $14.5 billion, but we send them to college for $14.5 billion, those 8 million people. We also create the Veterans Administration. The Veterans Administration. Under the same act? Yes, under the same act. The GI Bill also creates the Veterans Administration, or the VA is what we call it today the Veterans Administration. And the VA was supposed to provide what? No. Loans. Guaranteed loans to business for businesses, homes, and farms for veterans. 
was pro pro supposed to provide veterans loans for homes and businesses. So is that going to help veterans? Sure. Is that going to help the economy? If these people are buying new houses, how is that going to help the U.S. economy? Taxes. Taxes. What else? If they're buying new houses, oh, job creation. You know, again, yeah, you'll improve the stock market because more people are you know, buying stocks than Sherman Williams and people that build housing, uh, housing stuff. And so this will also improve the U.S. economy. And as a result of the GI Bill and all these people becoming far more successful, you have an economic boom in the 1950s through 1970s, and America becomes known as the affluent society. What does it mean to be affluent? Wealthy, successful, well off. We become known as the affluent society in the 1950s through 1970s. The affluent society. Because in the 1950s, guys, our income in America doubled. And then in the 1960s, it doubled again. So imagine, if in the 1940s, during the war, you're making $5,000, which is a, good, is a good salary. Then in the 1950s, you made 10000 And by the 1960s, you're making 20000 That's pretty good. Your salary is doubling every 10 years. I want that job where it doubles every 10 years. And so society got better, and more and more people had jobs. In fact, folks, when we look at the numbers, uh, Americans, even though they're only 6% of the population, controlled 40% of the world's wealth. So we talk about income disparity on a global scale. Yeah, Americans who only have 6% of the population of the world controlled 40% of it. We control pretty much half the world's wealth. That's not as true today, but it's still a large percentage. But it's not nearly as true today. But still, 6% controlled 40%. And because people are so wealthy now, or at least you have more people with more money, you have an increase in social mobility. What does that mean? Yeah, you can change social class. You have a lot of lower class people now moving into what? The middle class. The middle class, which means you have the growth of the middle class. And you have a growing middle class during this age. Monopoly's been around since like the 1930s. That's a really old game. I designed it. I would know. You like my game? Monopoly? Yeah. It's pretty good. You should. I once played Monopoly three times in one day. And I won two out of the three times. The third time they cheated. They just refused, they just refused to let me win. They're like, they land and say, oh, don't worry about paying me rent today. You can't do that. They have to pay you rent. <laughs> Jerks. You made me write growing monopoly classes. That's good. Growing monopoly classes. Uh, folks, the uh, middle class in 1947, there were 5.7 million in the middle class. By 1960, 12 million were part of the middle class. We doubled the middle class, guys. That's a huge number. More and more people are part of the middle class. And what are they doing in this middle class? Well, they want to have that American dream. So what are people buying in this new uh, life? Again, sorry, the numbers. 1960, 12 million. 1947, 5.7 million. And so you see the increase of suburbanization. Where are these middle class folks now going to move to? The suburbs, the suburban areas, not the city. They're moving away from the city. Because who's in the city? Immigrants, poor blacks. If you're wealthy, where are you going to move? Suburbs. So once people start moving to the suburbs, you see what becomes known as white flight. But that's what it's known as. Is when the whites became wealthy, did they leave the cities? Yes, and all the wealthy whites that had the money moved out to the suburbs because they could afford a single family home. They could afford to live out in the suburbs. And they don't want to live in the cities anymore with the immigrants and the blacks and the poor and the crime. So they moved out. And folks, they became more concerned about this new lifestyle. They thought about, you know, if I'm wealthy now, my income is up, the dream included two cars. You can own two cars now, not just the one, but two cars. They also said that this new lifestyle should include swimming pools. 
It was a big deal at the time to own a swimming pool. That means you made it. Nowadays, people don't want swimming pools. <laughs> it costs too much money to maintain. Yes, it does. Do you pay the bills at your house? <laughs> the electricity and the water bill for a pool, the upkeep and the maintenance, not worth it. So for me, when I was looking for a house, I did not want a pool. Now, there's a community pool that we can use and we have access to, but I personally don't want my own pool. I had to clean the pool when I was a teenager. I hated it. I don't want a pool. My kids can go to the beach if they want a pool. Ah, they also began buying TVs as those start emerging. And by 1960, guys, by 1960, 90% of Americans have televisions. So by 1960, 90% of Americans have televisions. And this is the new American life. Going out, moving to the suburbs, buying a home, two cars, you know, two kids, three kids. But that's the basic idea, guys, is that there's a new American dream. And why did moving, this, moving to the suburbs become so affordable? The emergence of Levitt towns. The emergence of Levitt towns made it much more affordable to buy homes. What are Levitt towns? This is a Levitt town, guys. What do you notice? They're all the same. All the houses are the same. Pretty much you have factory housing or what we like to call mass-produced houses or cookie-cutter houses. The basic idea is, are all the houses pretty much made exactly the same? Yeah. Maybe, I mean, when you guys bought your house, I mean, if you bought a new house or used house even, on your street there might be three kinds of houses, right? But that's it. And of those three, you get to choose one of them. But that's all you get to choose. Whereas before, each house was custom made. I want this, I want this, I want this. I want this, I want this, I want this. And every house would be the same different. Go to these old communities like South Pasadena where these old houses were built before the 1950s. Every house is different, right? They're all unique. Stone fixture here, column here. <coughs> Nowadays, to make houses affordable, they're all the same because do you have to bring in a new engineer each time? Do you have to bring in a new kind of electrician each time? No. It's today I make foundation here, foundation here, foundation here, foundation here. The next area comes in, electricity, 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 electricity. And I don't have to keep on looking at the plans every single time to figure out how to do it. It's the same way for the next 200 houses. And so does that reduce the price of houses? So Levittown's, you see the same cookie cutter houses and when it creates this conformity, right? Everyone has the same house. Everyone has the same yard. Maybe the difference is what type of color do you want on the outside of your house? You can choose from four. <laughs> no, but again, you create this conformity. You know, you see the images of every, all the dads leaving their houses at like 11 a.m. to mow the lawn on a Sunday morning. That everyone does at the same time. Everyone mows their lawn. Everyone, every wife brings out and they bring them in a lemonade. This is the story of what you're having. And so it wasn't just on streets. You had blocks of Levitt houses and entire communities of Levitt houses emerging at this time. But again, folks, is this not today? This is still what we do. To, even the million dollar houses, guys, those are still, you have like four different options and they're all built the same for the most part. They're nicer on the inside, sure, but they're still built the same because a custom house will be very expensive. In any case, so where are these people moving to? The Sun Belt. The Sun Belt encompasses the southern half of the U.S., Florida, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California. So the question is, why are people moving to the Sun Belt? And in particular, why are they moving to California? Because in 1963, California becomes the most populous state in the Union, and it remains that way to this day. We become the most populous state. So the question is, por qué? Why California? Or why this, these states in general? What do all these states have in common? Weather. Weather. So the first thing they have in common, guys, is climate. They have dry climates. Okay? With the exception of a hurricane here and there. I mean, here we have very few hurricanes, right? But it's still all part of that sun belt. And so because of that dry climate, new industries become begin moving into California, New Mexico, Arizona. The defense industry, so military, moves into California. Aerospace 
moves into California. Electronics moves into California. All the high-tech industries begin to move to California. And why is that, guys? What is it about California that makes it so desirable for high-tech industries to build there? That second point that you just made. What doesn't happen very often in these regions? Rain. It, we rarely have bad weather, guys. And think about it. If you're going to be building an airline or a plane or electronic chips, do you want to build those in an area that's very humid, where the water can seep into your factories, where it's going to rain, therefore you have to shut down production? How often does it rain in California? Not very often. Do we have to worry about snow half, half, no, halfway through the year? No. That is not an issue. And so because all those industries move to California, who will move to California? Why will people move to California then? The high-tech, high-paying jobs. This is why the population of California increases. High-tech, high-paying jobs. We're following the jobs, guys, and this is where they are in the Sun Belt. This is why California expands so dramatically in this time period. It's for the jobs. And to be fair, folks, you can't blame them. One, the jobs are great, but two, so is the climate. I mean, I always like to think, you know, people come here for vacation. We just live here all the time. Yeah. But think about it. Here in La Puente, you are 35 minutes away from the beach. You are 40 minutes away from snowboarding. You are 30 minutes away from Disneyland, 40 minutes away from Universal Studios, about two hours away from San Diego. I mean, you're next to everything you want to be near. And so again, it's not bad. I mean, what we have in Southern California is pretty awesome. And so this is why people start moving here. We have so much access, really the weather. And also, California is not super populated yet. And so there is a lot of cheap houses. There is a lot of places to buy. Nonetheless, folks, another major reason why people are moving to California and these regions is war-torn countries. Sorry, immigrants from war-torn and impoverished countries or immigrants from Asia and Latin America. You'll also have immigrants coming in from Asia and Latin America because of issues like war, economic problems, depression, that kind of stuff. But that's why the Sun Belt will grow. Yeah. Ah, uh, there are still border checks, but we have it kind of relaxed a little bit. We've relaxed the border. Yeah, pretty much. We still have quotas, but again, remember how when we looked at those numbers, there wasn't very many quotas from Asia? And there weren't very many quotas from China either, because we ended the Chinese Exclusion Act during World War II, because China was our ally during World War II. So you have a lot more open immigration. So now that everyone's happy, people have jobs, you have houses, you see the return of the cult of domesticity. <laughs> My fridge is that big. I just, I just bought a new one, not that full. But I bought a fridge that's, that's pretty full. In any case, with the return of the cult of domesticity, guys quiet, this was made possible because of an increase in income. Could you now support a family with a single income? Some families could. You only needed one bread maker, as they would call it, only need one income. And so if the husband worked, would the wife have to work? No, no because in most cases, husbands were making a good amount of money because of the increase in wages. And so, the expectation was, hey, you don't have to work, so what should you do? Oh. Stay at home, raise the kids, cook and clean. That's your responsibility. And so you see the return of the cult of domesticity. And to be fair, this is not a bad thing. I mean, in reality, is it better to have a parent at home to watch the kids all the time? It doesn't have to be the dad. I'm a mom. It could be the dad. I mean, if my fiance ends up making like a million dollars, I want to be a stay-at-home dad. I'm going to take care of my kids because that would be fun for me. I would love taking care of my kids all day. But in any case, that's the change is that women are expected to be home. But here's the fun part. When women are at home, is it still work? 
it's still a job for them, even though they're not making a salary. They're saving money, really, if you think about it. They're not buying food, they're making it themselves. But again, the expectation is women still have to get dressed, they put on the pearls, they put on the earrings, they do their hair, they put on the dress so they can clean the house. But that's what it is. It's the expectation that's there. Again, here's women, that was like, did you make that stack of you know, pancakes that I asked for? <laughs> sure did. And this cult of domesticity, again, here you see it, the husband goes to work and so the kid and the mom stay home. It's promoted through television, radio, and the TV shows that promote, shh, guys quiet. The TV shows that promote this cult of domesticity are TV shows like Father Knows Best. TV shows like Ozzy and Harriet. Not yet. But your Father Knows Best, Ozzy and Harriet, and Leave It to Beaver. These are all TV shows that promote this idyllic American lifestyle. This is what American life is supposed to be. And here's a clip of that. and you promote this idyllic way of life, the father, the mother, you have this nuclear family going on, and so you have that being promoted by television. So now you have the family, you have the cult of domesticity, you have the wage, you have the income, you have the house. So next up we have to work on is having babies. So 
you also see the emergence of the baby boom in the 1950s. And in fact, between 1946 and 1961, 63.5 million babies are born in the US. This is the largest growth spurt in our history. <laughs> 63.5 million in 15 years. People were having a lot of babies at this time. And a lot of it came down to, did we have a lot of babies during the Great Depression? No, so we're mating, making up for lost time. Also, were a lot of people happy now that they had a lot of income? Sure, so you have a change in the philosophy. Also, do you have more middle class and less lower class? So you have a lot more people that feel confident. Stop. Anyway, so, you have a lot more people that feel confident to have children. Uh, this is, again, the largest growth. And a lot of it stems from, again, economic confidence. Are you going to have kids if you know that the economy is going to fail? No. You have kids because you have confidence in the economy. You feel that your job will be there next year. And so the baby boom is promoted due to economic confidence. You feel that the economy will stay the same or get better. And that's a boom for us. Well, what is the impact of this baby boom that you have so much of? Well, one of the crazy changes, folks, is that because 63.5 million are born in 15 years, uh, you're going to have a rapid expansion of schools, like, say, La Puente High School. You guys think about how the school is kind of built all crazy-like, randomly all over the place? That was built in this way because we were just finding places to build schools because the population was growing so quickly. You know, one year you have a school of 500. The next year you're told you have to have 300 more kids. And the following year you're going to have 1,000 kids. Where do you build 10 extra classrooms? Well, we have space over there. We have space over here. We have space over here. And so you now you have this school that's kind of built all haphazardly, right? I mean, the front of the school faces outward. It doesn't face inward. And that's not a good way to have a school because now you have to go around this gate. And so it wasn't well planned because we didn't have very much time. These kids were growing up, and we had to build the schools. And you think we can build this in a year? This takes time to build an entire building that's you know, commercial grade ready, school grade ready. And so we built these things, and we built them quickly. Like, oh, wait, are we going to build the fence? No, we don't have any money. No, oh, OK, we won't build the fence then. So again, all these problems emerge, and we're building schools quickly. The problem you also see emerge is that once all of these kids graduate, what happens to all those teachers that we hired for the baby boom? We're going to lay them all off because we don't need that many teachers anymore. If, th if 60 million teachers are, say, there's like 100,000 teachers that are needed for these 60 million people, that's a lot of, uh, I guess they're going to build more classrooms though. <laughs> there's a truck of like just giant truck just passed by with pipes. I'm just shocked by that. Um, but uh, what's going to happen to all those teachers? They're going to lose their jobs because you're not going to have another 60 million kids being born thereafter. And so you have this massive increase in schools and then a massive decrease in employment after. It's kind of crazy. Other industries that will rise because of the baby boom? Uh, baby food? Rock music, because these kids will grow up and be the rock generation. Jeans, because jeans will be really popular among the youth. You saw one of the kids wearing jeans in the video. You'll also have job competition, serious job competition, because you have 60 million more people competing for jobs. Is that going to be problematic for some? Sure. And also, it's going to put uh, stress on Social Security. These are the people taking our money. It's their generation that are retiring. My parents. They are straining Social Security. Well, we have these kids, and how do we take care of them? Well, uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock writes a book called The Common Sets Book of Baby Care. And pretty much he says the best person to raise a child is who? Mother. The mother. So the mother should stay home. So you have TV telling you, society telling you, and now research telling you that a mother should stay home and take care of her child. Now, is that incorrect? I think all signs show that having a mother take care of your kid is pretty good. Having a father take care of your kid is also pretty good. Having no parents take care of your kid, not good. So I think it's just pretty simple research. A mother and her uh, child work really well together. And the argument in this book was a mother should stay home, take care of the children, and parents should trust themselves. Parents should trust themselves. Like You don't always have to listen to your grandparents or whatever parents should trust themselves in raising their kids like you know your kid best 
So if the parent down the street is like, oh, you should always feed your kid broccoli, but you know your kid hates broccoli but is really into spinach, well then adjust. Because there's no one size fits all solution for all kids. You should trust yourself. Cool? Okay. So that's kind of it for the families. There's three more policies I want to talk about. And then we'll be kind of done for today because I know people have to leave at 45. And uh, we're ending early today anyway because there's no EIT tomorrow. No. I got rid of it for tomorrow. I was just like, <laughs> done, no EIT. So some of the things that we do, these other policies that are just kind of cool that Truman's doing. Number one, he creates a civil rights commission to promote rights for who? Blacks, African Americans. So he creates a civil rights commission to promote rights for blacks. So they create a civil rights commission to help with black rights. And what they recommend are things like anti-lynching laws. They want to have anti-lynching laws, because that's still happening. Yeah, it's all the way through the 1960s. Lynching is happening all the time through the 1960s. So anti-lynching laws. They also want to end poll taxes. What is a poll tax? You must pay to vote. Very good. So anti-lynching laws and poll taxes. But one of the things that they recommend that the president does do is they go ahead and Truman agrees. Truman successfully desegregates the military and federal government. So one thing that Truman does do that's recommended by the Civil Rights Commission is he desegregates the military and federal government. So finally, are we stepping in the right direction? Yeah. Yes. It's a big change, too. Desegregation of the military and federal government. His argument is, look, states may be racist, but should the federal government be? No. 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 So the federal government should be desegregated to lead by example. Okay? Another law that you guys should know that's passed, the Presidential Succession Act of 1947. The Presidential Succession Act of 1947 pretty much outlined the next 20 people who would be president if the person before them died. The reason why this is important is that in this new age, what is the major threat? Nuclear weapons. Now, during the State of the Union, folks, the president is there, right? The vice president, President Pro Tempore, and all the cabinet members. So is it possible that all these people might be killed by a nuclear weapon? Sure. So the Presidential Succession Act created the Order of Succession. It creates the Order of Succession as a nuclear contingency. And you don't have to write all of this down. But it's a nuclear contingency. The basic idea is if the person dies who's next in line, we have a few more people below them. And what happens is that when there is a State of the Union address where everyone goes, Congress, the President, Vice President, all the cabinet members, one cabinet member has to draw a straw and that cabinet member is put in the secret underground bunker for the remainder of the State of the Union. <laughs> because if we don't do that and they are all killed, will there be a power vacuum? And might people fight to see who becomes the next president? This way, there is no fight. It's clear who the next president of the United States is going to be. Hilda Solis, by the way, would have been 12th in line to be president before she stepped down. Yeah, she. this is not a new list. This is uh, from last year. But again, Hilda Solis, she stepped down, but she would have been 12th in line to be president of the United States had the other 11 people died. Which is still kind of cool. Huh? It's created in the order of the creation of the position. That's why. So all the secretaries are created in the order of their creation. The last thing you guys have to know today, the 22nd Amendment. The 22nd Amendment is created that limits a president to two four-year terms. It limits a president to two four-year terms and a maximum of 10 years. Why? 
Because you could be vice president for two years, right? Now, if you're vice president for two years and a day, are you allowed to be president for a, no. another term? Yeah. You can serve one more re-election term, but you can't serve more than that. So you can't be president for 10 years and a day. It's two, t two years as vice president and two full four-year terms. Make sense, everyone? Cool. So those are all the policies of Truman thus far that don't have to do with communism. On Monday when we come back, guys, we'll talk about the policies regarding communism. So here's the thing. Some of you uh, need to be, well, actually, all of you need to know. Uh, you have chapter 37, right? That's due on Monday. What else is due on Monday? Yes. Unit 9 test, Unit 9 DBQ. Make sure you guys complete all of that. If you don't, you'll be missing quite a bit. And that's it for us.